Governments have known about the causes and consequences of global warming for over three decades, but most have so far failed to respond effectively to the threat to our planet. As world leaders meet for climate talks in the UK, journalist Amanda Burrell has been asking why politicians there and everywhere have struggled to take decisive action. For anyone still in doubt or in denial that the world's climate is changing, the summer of 2021 should have been a wake-up call. One natural disaster followed another. Even normally temperate Britain saw its share of extreme weather. The truth is, man-made global warming is now irrefutable. And that's why world leaders are gathering, once more, to discuss how to respond. With things so critical, it's apt that the COP26 summit is taking place here in the UK. It's where the Industrial Revolution began in the 19th century, when fossil fueled mass production started releasing rising amounts of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping gases into the atmosphere. Where that might lead didn't become clear for a long time, but for at least 30 years now, we've known that unless we reduce carbon emissions, then climate change would have the dire consequences we are now seeing for all of us, no matter where we live. I've come to the village of Hemsby in Norfolk, and I've been told that there's a man who's living right on the front line of climate change. And the name of the house gives a clue as to why. Lance, hello, hello. hello I'm Amanda. Nice to meet you. Oh, wow. It might look pretty here, but as with many parts of the world, there's a growing threat from extreme weather and rising sea levels. Since the early 1990s, almost two thirds of this beach on the UK's east coast have been washed away. Much of it during a huge storm in 2018. And that took everything away from underneath the house. It was that bad that in fact, I was still in the kitchen, I heard a resounding crack underneath my feet, looked down and I could see the sea. So that's what happened. It's literally sort of hanging over the edge of the cliff. Friends helped Lance move his home 10 meters inland and he's built his own sea defences. But these are only temporary measures, and it's hard to be optimistic. I was a climate change sceptic, like everybody, I think. But I think living here really opens your eyes up. And it's really scary, because you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Hemsby's been a popular holiday spot for over a century. But as its beach diminishes, so too do its prospects. People here have had to start preparing for the worst, as a local politician tells me. We have emergency plans in place, which we never dreamed of doing beforehand. We have evacuation centres all set up. Have you had to evacuate people? We have, yeah. But when we evacuated the people, we only originally thought that was for the night. Never in our wildest dreams did we end up thinking we would have to demolish 11 or 12 homes. The local authorities are discussing building a system of defences against the encroaching sea but progress is frustratingly slow, and they may not be finished anytime soon, or even be enough. Those rocks there, they're fortifications from World War II, which the villagers have put there in an attempt to protect themselves from the sea. And the irony of using those to deal with the emergency now, I mean, we should be on a wartime footing, and they should have been for decades, but it's only now that people are finally getting it. What's happening at Hemsby is just one example of what's going on all over the world as climate change becomes more noticeable. What's odd, though, is why this country, of all countries, might be caught unawares. After all, a former British Prime Minister was one of the first politicians to start raising the alarm. It is mankind and his activities which are changing the environment of our planet in damaging and dangerous ways. Over the next 30 years, many other leaders promised action. At Rio, we have made a start. Since 1995, there have been annual UN gatherings known as COP summits. Everybody tried very hard. No more, blah, blah, blah. Action now. 
Most famously, at one in Paris in 2015, nearly 200 countries agreed to limit global temperature rise to 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels at most, and ideally 1.5. They also promised to balance the amount of carbon they produced with that removed to reach what is known as net zero. But promises at summits are easier to make than to fulfill, and emissions have carried on rising. So leaders have made more pledges, more promises. There is no planet blah, 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 blah. Targets have been missed, and the world has become warmer, with entirely foreseeable consequences. We face the possibility of systemic environmental collapse. One or more of the Earth's systems suddenly flips from one stable state into a different one. For instance, you know, we could see an ice shelf flipping and basically collapsing into the sea. And when one flips, that can trigger the flipping of a load of others. You can get a cascade of impacts, and that's happened during mass extinction events in the past. And, and that's fundamentally what we face. Author and journalist George Monbiot has been campaigning for the environment for 36 years. Why does he think we're in this position now? Politicians just push everything into the future, where it'll be someone else's problem. You know, if we don't fix things now, well, we're not going to be in office when things go to custard later on. And so there's every incentive not to deal with the biggest crisis that humanity has ever faced. Of course, if every political generation just passes the buck, the bigger the challenge becomes. In truth, fossil fuels are now so intertwined with every aspect of modern lives that reducing our reliance on them means making fundamental and possibly unpopular changes to the way we live. Politicians in the UK have been as reluctant to force through those changes as anywhere else. Jill Rutter is a former British civil servant. She was involved in the publication of several sustainable development strategies in the 1990s and 2000s. Climate change is a really massive problem for government. It requires a whole scale economic transformation in a very short window. So it's a real challenge to make you know, meaningful action across all fronts simultaneously. You tend to get the sort of line of least resistance that it's what you can get other people to accept. According to the science, even if dramatic action is taken today, climate change will continue to worsen for at least a couple more decades. That's not appealing for leaders who depend on public support to stay in power. If you're saying to politicians, you are taking quite difficult and potentially quite unpopular decisions now for a benefit that not only won't be seen during your electoral term, they might not be seen during your political lifetime. It's really quite a difficult political sell. Yeah, it's a pretty altruistic politician who's going to say, yeah, that's top of my agenda. Yet some politicians have seen electoral advantage in the crisis. In 2010, David Cameron's Conservative Party won power in Britain after promising to deal with a problem ignored by previous governments. David Cameron decided that he was going to embrace the need to act on climate change and use that as part of his strategy of detoxifying and changing people's views about the Conservative Party. But, says Rutter, on becoming Prime Minister, Cameron then balked at the likely economic costs. When he saw the effect of some of the climate change levies on electricity bills, you know, said, well, we shouldn't have all this, you know, his term was green crap, putting up energy prices. So politicians have conflicting concerns. As a result, a government that promised to be the greenest ever turned out to be at best lukewarm on dealing with climate change. Cameron's administration did phase out coal-fired power stations and build on work of previous governments by supporting renewable energy, but later gave the go-ahead for controversial fracking programmes. As other governments around the world have found, the reality of facing down opposition from powerful vested interests is challenging. I would like you to please welcome Helen Clark, New Zealand's first elected woman prime minister. 
what happened some years ago in New Zealand is a good case in point. In 1999, Helen Clark became Prime Minister. Sustainability, I believe, has become the defining issue of the early 21st century. Her government looks set to be one of the first anywhere to cut carbon emissions. New Zealand was one of the very early countries when I was Prime Minister to say, we are going to aim to be you know, net carbon neutral. And that was very ambitious at the time. The full weight of the climate crisis hadn't really dawned on people. You know, people were worrying about other things. Then in 2003, Clark's government sought to tax the methane emitted by livestock. As the dairy industry is a significant part of the New Zealand economy, this was no small proposal. But some 60% of the country's emissions came from animals, and reducing that figure was a priority. And it was very, very difficult. The agricultural community loathed it. A petition against it was signed by nearly half the country's farmers. Around 400 blocked the streets of New Zealand's capital, Wellington, in protest. The tax was abandoned. We eventually went for an emissions trading scheme proposal and we made agriculture the last to come in. Uh, and then there was a change of government. They, they never came in. Tackling the climate crisis is a long-term endeavour. I think what is important for leaders is to recognise that the goal is far more about than just about winning an election. What is the point of winning elections if you don't use the political capital to do the things that need to be done? Yet many politicians now in office seem reluctant to follow that advice. A 2021 UN report published ahead of the COP26 summit shows that with nation's current targets, the planet is on course to warm to a catastrophic 2.7 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That would seem to justify determined and effective measures from our governments. So why the hesitancy still? Could the answer lie in the way we all respond to anything other than immediate threats? If so, then perhaps political reactions to the climate crisis are a matter of psychology. Much of our culture is still not paying any attention to it or pretending it's not happening. And we see that in some ways all around us. But if you think about game shows that might focus on long haul flights as a prize, that is just denying the reality of carbon intensive practices um, to an almost ludicrous degree. We're not rational beings, so we don't always respond to the threat in a rational way. What we do is we experience the anxiety, but then we try and unconsciously push it out of the way. As the climate crisis gets closer and closer, maybe we'll do something about it. On the other hand, it's possible that we may engage in more and more um, destructive defense mechanisms all these instincts and emotions that we've been talking about, how do they play out in the political arena? What we can forget um, too easily, perhaps, is that politicians of whatever stripe, whatever party, are also human beings. So they're all caught up in the same kinds of processes of everyday denial and defence as me and you, as the rest of us. For George Monbiot, the decisions that need to be made are quite straightforward but he doesn't think politicians will ever willingly take them. Eating less meat, flying less, changing the way we travel, insulating our homes, consuming less, all those require mobilising the public and often confronting some of our tendencies. And, and politicians don't want to do that. They absolutely don't want to go there. They don't want to do anything which people might feel resistant towards. And, yeah, you know, you tell people, we want you to drive your car less, and people, some people are going to react against that. It's often left up to local politicians and activists to do the right thing. But even on a much smaller scale, on issues that would seem relatively easy to resolve, those trying to push through apparently climate-friendly policies face many of the same obstacles. So making transport sustainable is one of the key steps that need to be taken on the route to net zero. So here in London, there's a push to encourage cycling. But of course, putting plans into concrete action on the ground can be easier said than done. And I've heard that in the usually quiet neighborhood of Chiswick, tensions are high because of these cycle lanes. I don't think you can ever keep everybody happy, um, but I have not seen this kind of dissent in 21 years. I've never seen this in my life anywhere over anything, honestly. Margie Frew is involved with One Chiswick, 
a local group fiercely opposed to the introduction of two-way cycle lanes. Our group believes that this is not a safe cycle lane. I've seen so many near misses, I can't even tell you. They've eliminated the bus lane, which now means the buses have to stop all along. Every car behind it stops. Idling traffic, fumes are created. I didn't consider myself a, a radical cyclist, and in a way I've been radicalized by seeing the opposition and hearing a story that it's the death of the village, it's the death of commerce, it's the end of the world, and people need to change. You have to leave space for these new new ideas. Councillor Hanif Khan has already been working on this one small scheme for two years. We have consulted. We have spoken to many residents in many different ways. There are so many angles to look at from businesses to our elderly residents. So it's complicated. I mean, the most challenging thing for me is the hostility that we receive through a divided community. And that's what these low traffic neighborhoods are doing. It all begs the question, if a modest proposal to expand cycle lanes in one small part of one city can lead to such fierce arguments. Weird, now I'll get, okay, go across. From where can the UK government, or indeed any government, summon the will to try and transform the planet? The British government has now made a commitment to reach net zero by 2050. It's got some impressive goals in place. Green is good. Green is right. Green works. But how exactly it will get there is less clear. Much needs to be done. At the moment, it's not even on course to hit its targets for 2035. And this despite growing evidence from opinion polls that a majority of British people want to see the country reduce its emissions faster and set an example for others. John Gummer, now Lord Deben, was the UK's Environment Secretary between 1993 and 7. Today, he chairs the Climate Change Committee, which advises the government on emissions targets. Well, you have to make the promises, because if you don't have the targets and you don't have the uh, parameters, you, you won't do it. But it's always more difficult to move from policy to action, and it's always more difficult to deliver. Uh, that's true of anything. I remember when I was Secretary of State, one was slightly laughed at, thought rather, you know, sort of a bit bit peculiar, really. I mean, this is it's re renewables. Uh, I mean, renewables were seen, what you really want is good, strong, masculine things with big central systems which send, send the stuff out, not these sort of fairy windmills and all the rest of it. And, and we've had to change that. And you change that because government makes a tough decision and enables new industries to flourish. And that's what we have to do much more effectively. It's not all bad news. Over the past two decades, government support has enabled Britain's offshore wind industry to come to life. In 2020, it accounted for around a quarter of the country's electricity generation. It's a key reason why emissions here have gone down by over 40% compared to 1990. But the government is also planning to allow new oil fields and a coal mine. 270,000 jobs were supported by the British oil and gas industry in 2019. Making the full transition to clean energy is a challenge for leaders. How might they pull it off? I'm on my way to Teesside in the northeast of England. Now, this area sprang to life during the Industrial Revolution and became a bustling manufacturing hub known for its iron and steel mills and its chemical production. And now, politicians are banking on it having a major role in the transition to a net zero economy. The British government is investing over £500 million in the region. It's already one of the UK's offshore wind power hubs. The mayor here, Ben Houchen, has a grand vision for the area, which includes a more controversial technology. Teesside fell into decline in the 1980s following the closure of its steelworks. Houchen is planning to build a global net zero hub here. On this 4,500 acre site known as Teesworks, the old infrastructure is being demolished and the ground leveled, ready for investors. There's already interest from General Electric, who plan to build a wind turbine blade factory here. 
20,000 jobs will be created, Houchin tells me, and a facility built which will process carbon emissions from industries on site and in the surrounding area. We're actually stood on the site of one of the amazing projects that we've managed to secure, which will be the world's first modern industrial scale carbon capture and storage facility that will capture over 10 million tonnes of carbon every single year. This multi-billion dollar project is a joint venture between oil companies BP, Equinor and Total. Names that don't exactly spring to mind as champions of environmentally friendly low carbon initiatives. And some scientists remain deeply skeptical about how sustainable carbon capture can be at scale. But Houchin isn't concerned. You'll have the old oil and gas companies who have extracted huge amounts of fossil fuels and carbon, in effect, from underneath the North Sea, uh, putting it back into those cabins. I mean, I have no problem with working with oil and gas companies because they know that the writing's on the wall for, for fossil fuels and they're trying to seek a new future to continue with their business. For climate change activists, schemes like this often carry the taint of greenwashing, of muddy and ineffective compromise with interests that helped create the problem in the first place. The most important thing we should do is to stop producing greenhouse gases in the first place. But that's what governments don't want to do because of the power of vested interests. You know, you, you have these big legacy industries like the fossil fuel industry, which have enormous political power because they have a lot of money. Governments don't want to confront them. You know, we're tinkering around at the edges of the system, whereas a systemic threat, which is what we face, requires systemic change. And the fundamental problem here is the sheer volume of economic activity. That's what's hammering the planet, and that's what we need to reduce. And that means we actually need to stop growing. Yet, like it or not, that appetite for growth, which gave rise to the steelworks in Teesside back in their heyday, is still the main driving force behind the competitive global economy today. Inevitably, political leaders everywhere worry that pursuing policies to combat climate change could put them at an economic disadvantage if other countries don't follow suit. One of the cases that we did used to try to make when I was at the Environment Department was, well, there was a first mover advantage that if economies were going to have to move in that direction anyway, rather than be stranded with a bunch of you know, redundant industries based on fossil fuels. You want to be in the vanguard of the new industrial revolution, if you like. We never quite managed to convince some of our economic department colleagues who would say, well, actually, it might be better just to be the sort of second move, you know, let other people go there first, and we can be very quick copiers. Fear of failure, fear of losing power, fear of sacrificing national advantage, it's easy to understand why some governments have been slow to respond to climate change. But it's also clear why many people are now losing patience. They've said they'll decarbonise by 2050. None of them have a serious plan how to do it. We're actually helping politicians we're actually helping people in business, we're actually helping people in the city to move in a different direction. It needs people power to do that. Extinction Rebellion, or XR, is an activist movement that started in 2019 with the aim of using non-violent direct action to effect change. Its first rebellion in UK in April that year led to the British government declaring a climate emergency. But two and a half years on, and they're back on the streets. Humanity has to make a change, like we don't have a choice. Some of these activists are so desperate that they're prepared to go to jail in order to draw attention to their cause. But their voices are being heard and even garnering some political support. Clive Lewis is a Labour MP. And one of the things about politicians like me is that we sit here in here and we pass legislation. There's lots of different power bases putting us. Big companies, big money, banking institutions, vested interests, have a disproportionate pull and influence on our politics. We see it in this country, we see it in the US, we see it across the world. There's an old expression, uh, power concedes nothing without demand. People need to demand more of their politicians, demand more of their systems, and unless they do that, I don't think we'll move at the speed that we need to. 
Even for Lord Deben, change is long overdue. This is a revolutionary world. Uh, it's a revolutionary forced upon us by the fact that we've allowed climate change to get out of control. And taking back control means a very wholehearted change in the way which we structure things. When the world first began to wake up to the dangers of global warming over three decades ago, political leaders still had the luxury of time to consider the implications and take the necessary action. Now, climate change is here. It's real, and its effects are already being felt. Time, for all of us, including our politicians, is fast running out.